grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. If we are to consider the martyrdom of John the Baptist from anything other than the theology of the cross, we are bound to conclude that John was an utter failure, whose work came to nothing, and that he was rejected by God himself. But when we consider the life of John according to the theology of the cross, that is, that God's ways are not our ways, and that God's work, God works in the most unexpected ways, notably the way of shame and rejection and suffering and even unjust death, then and only then are we able to begin to recognize John the Baptist as one whom God has called and used for extraordinary service in his kingdom. And so the theology of the cross sees things and says things, not the way we would like to see things and tell things, but as they really are. Our thoughts are fixed on safety and comfort, acceptance and success, according to the generally accepted definition of these things. But the prophet Isaiah, speaking for God, says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. This evening, we consider the martyrdom of John the Baptist. From every human standard, a failure, an example to be forewarned against. But according to our Lord, I tell you that among those born of women, none is greater than John. There is a striking correspondence between John and Jesus that is found in the Gospels that compares one with the other as no one else. In all four Gospels, John the Baptist is the only other person whose birthday is recorded except for the birth of Christ. Like his Savior, John's birth is unexpected and miraculous. Like his Savior, John's parents are instructed by an angel as to the name he is to be given. In all four Gospels, John the Baptist is the only other person whose death is recorded except for the death of Christ. Like his Savior, John's death is an unjust and bloody death carried out in envy and anger and bitter resentment. Like his Savior, John's death comes at the hands of a civil ruler who is pressured into executing an innocent man because he is more interested in his reputation than in the truth. And all of this, of course, is ordered by God himself, whose ways are not our ways. John pointed to Jesus, not just by the sermons that he preached, but also by the way that he lived. By his public preaching, John pointed to Jesus, declaring him to be the long-awaited Messiah who has come to redeem sinners and make all things new. And therefore, the time to repent and to turn from the old way of thinking and living and dying has come. John proclaimed for all to hear that this turning from death and hell happens in no other way than in baptism, a holy washing away of sin and a complete drowning unto death of the old sinful nature that constantly strives to have its way with us as opposed to God's way with us. Through baptism and not apart from it, we are not only turned away from the road to hell that we were born running on, but by the power of the Holy Spirit working through the water and the word, we are turned around and set to run in a new direction in the way of the truth and the life that now hates the evil that we do and desires only to do the good that gives all glory and honor to the one who is truly good, Jesus Christ our Lord. By his faithful preaching even unto death, John pointed to Jesus declaring him to be the one who is worthy of willingly and even joyfully dying for. John counted it the highest honor that even his blood 
might be mingled with the blood of the martyrs upon whom the Church of Christ is built. This wondrous flow of martyrs' blood that boldly declares the good news that the way of the cross is the way of God. The curtain on our Gospel reading opens on Herod the Tetrarch. This Herod was the son of Herod the Great, who was the ruler at the time of John and Jesus' birth, who slaughtered the infants in Bethlehem in an attempt to kill the baby who was called the King of the Jews. Herod the Tetrarch took a series of wives, just as his father, Herod the Great, was also famous for doing. One in particular is singled out for being particularly repulsive to the Jews, her name being Herodias. She was Herod's sister-in-law, Herod's brother's Philip's wife. To make matters even more disgusting, it is no mere coincidence that Herodias sounds an awful lot like Herod. In fact, they are of the same family. Herodias is Herod's niece. So in a day when the holy institution of marriage was being blatantly mocked, can you imagine that? John the Baptist spoke out against Herod, it is not lawful for you to have her. Desperate to shut him up, Herod has John bound and put in prison. Matthew informs us of Herod's true motives, saying though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because the people held John to be a prophet. Herod is a true politician who determines his action based on public perception. Can you imagine that? But the devil is never satisfied with anything but the death of a saint. But when Herod's birthday came, Herod threw a party. Mark tells us that the guests consisted of his nobles, military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee, a very impressive group. As a surprise birthday gift, Herodias has her daughter dance before the company, and it pleased Herod. And Herod plays the big shot in front of his guests so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. On a platter means that this is not to be a private beheading done quietly. This is to be a public spectacle, for Herodias knows that she has got her husband caught in a trap that he himself set when he made his oath in front of his guests. And so it is that Herod who wanted to kill John but didn't because he was afraid of the people, now doesn't want to kill John but does because he is afraid of his reputation. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. Clearly, there is nothing in this man that moves him to do the right thing simply because it is the right and just thing to do. And John's head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Thankfully, none of the Gospel writers in their consideration for John's family and his disciples who would later read their Gospel tell us just what Herodias did with John's head. Matthew simply writes, and his disciples came and took the body and buried it. Just as we are not informed of the emotions of those who took Jesus' body down from the cross and buried it, neither are we told what thoughts and emotions John's disciples must have had and felt as they came to Herod's palace to collect their rabbi's body. But who would be surprised if they hadn't recited Psalm 44 as we just did you have made us like sheep for the slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. 
You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me, and shame has covered my face at the sound of the taunter and the reviler, at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you, and we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart is not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. And so it is that we see that this theology of the cross is a hard theology. It is not the religion of man. For what man would ever imagine that this is the way of God, let alone that this is the way of a loving God who has come to redeem his creation and his people. And so it's no wonder that we prefer a theology of glory that fashions a God in our own image who rewards the righteous here and now, who punishes the wicked here and now. We want to have the rewards of faith here and now. We can't wait for the light to come because who really knows if it will really come. And they went and they told Jesus. And in the next verse we read, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself which is not what we expected to hear. This is not what we would have expected from a savior who has come to rescue us and deliver us. After all, John bravely spoke up against Herod in defense of the truth at the cost of his very life. Why doesn't Jesus speak up and defend the truth or at least his cousin, John? This is the question that Luther addresses in a sermon on Titus chapter 2. And we'll close by quoting a small portion of it. Luther writes, Christ is risen from the dead, has ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of God in divine power and honor. Nevertheless, he is hiding his greatness, glory, majesty, and power. He allows his prophets and apostles to be expelled and murdered, his holy martyrs to be flung into bonds and prison, to be scourged, stoned, hacked, and stabbed to pieces, and miserably done away with. He allows his Christians to suffer want, trouble, and misfortune in this world. He acts as he did in the days of his flesh when John the Baptist had to lose his head for the sake of a desperate harlot. While he, the Savior and Helper, said nothing about it, departed in a ship and withdrew to the solitude of a wilderness. Is he not a petty God, a childish God, who does not save himself and allows his children to suffer as if he did not see how badly they were faring? Then as the writings of the prophets and the Psalms state, the godless boast. They mocked the Christians and their God saying, where is their God now? If he is God, let him contend for his rights and the rights of his people so that his name may not be rooted out and his people may not suffer. If he does not see what is going on, then he has no eyes to see and no reason to understand. On the other hand, if he does see, and know all that goes on, but allows these things to happen, 
then he is no good, faithful God and has no heart for his people. Likewise, he sees and knows but cannot help. And then he has no hands that are able to do anything, nor does he have power to enable him to save. And so the prophet Isaiah correctly says of God, truly, you are a God who hides himself. For he hides his omnipotence, his wisdom, his power, and his might, and he acts so childishly, as though he could do nothing, as though he knew nothing, as though he understood nothing or did not want to do anything. He lets us call and cry and says nothing, as though he were deep in thought or were busy or were out in the field or asleep and heard nothing as Elijah says of Baal. Meanwhile, Christians baptized in his name must hold still, must permit people to walk over them and must have patience. For in this present kingdom of faith, God wants to be small. But in the future kingdom of sight, he will not be small, but great. Then he will show that he saw the misery of his people and he heard their crying and he had a will inclined to help them and also the power to help them. For this appearance of the glory of the great God, we must simply wait. This waiting for the appearance of the glory of the great God that Luther speaks of is what John the Baptist pointed us to by his preaching and his martyrdom. We live by faith in the word and promise of God, trusting that God is faithful and his word never fails, so that neither tribulation, nor distress, nor persecution, nor famine, nor nakedness, nor danger, nor sword shall separate us from the love of Christ.